Dr. Joanne Hamilton earned her PhD from San Diego State University and University of California, San Diego in the joint doctoral program and specialized in neuropsychology. Her fellowship was completed at the Sh Shiley Ma Ooh, Marcos Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, where Dr. Hamilton was the principal investigator of an RO1 research award investigating cognitive changes in Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. Dr. Hamilton currently works in clinical practice to translate scientific knowledge into practical tools to bring about meaningful advances in daily life for those living with Parkinson's. Uh, Dr. Joanne Hamilton, thank you so much for being here. I can't wait for this presentation. So I'm gonna let you get started. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so first of all, apparently when you do these Zoom things, you have to have your lighting quite right and the sun came out. So if you guys are having a hard time seeing me because of any glare, um, please let um, the let Mel know so that she can tell me and I can keep moving this desk around. Um, I want to say good morning to everybody. Um, you know, we're really excited uh, to be sharing the morning with you. I I'm really sorry that we're not physically present, but thanks to this kind of technology, at least we don't have to give up our social connections. Um, I'm going to be honest, it's a little bit strange to do this without being able to see everybody's faces. So I took Polly's advice this morning and I drew a bunch of little happy smiley faces across the top of my screen. Um, so now there's 600 little, little stickies up there. Um, I'm kidding, there's not 600. Um, I'd also like to thank the Davis Finney Foundation for giving me the opportunity to share this information about two really important non-motor signs that are caused by Parkinson's, the cognitive and emotional side of the of Parkinson's. It's important as we're going through to realize, let's see, how come, there we go. It's important as we're going through to realize that you really can't separate the cognitive from the behavioral aspects entirely. They're, they're highly interrelated. So as I'm talking, even though I'm gonna separate them out in, my, in the slides, realize that the two combine to generate the response. I'm gonna share this little icon with you throughout the day because I feel it's so important to keep that in mind. Today, we'll talk about um, the, we'll talk about understanding why these cognitive and behavioral changes occur in a, in a motor disease. I think I've told you guys this before in, in previous Davis Finney uh, talks that 20 years ago or so when a person was diagnosed with Parkinson's and maybe even more recently for some of you, you were told by your neurologist that you would have a tremor, you'd be stiff, you may have trouble walking, but that physician may not have told you that there are a multiple uh, types of changes that will occur in Parkinson's in some folks that that aren't motor related. So I will talk a little bit about those today. I want you to understand um, what those, what the most common cognitive and behavioral changes are in Parkinson's, how they affect your day-to-day -day life. And then we're gonna spend quite a lot of this talk learning how to manage these challenges. And specifically during this difficult time with the stay at home orders that some of us are under and just generally a, a, a fear since this is a vulnerable population. So let's start out and remember that little, that little icon over there is keeping us in track that, that you can't separate these cognitive and behavioral changes altogether. The types of changes that we're gonna talk about today are thinking changes and then behavioral changes. Uh, behavioral changes that are most common are depression, depression and anxiety, hallucinations um, and delusions, impulse control issues, apathy. There are also changes that uh, Connie and Davis just mentioned regarding uh, sleep changes and pain. And luckily, uh, we have great speakers today. So I'm just gonna focus on the, hmm, my slides are doing weird things, on the depression and anxiety, hallucinations and delusions, impulse control issues, and the apathy. So these changes are very common in Parkinson's. The mood, the mood changes, that is, are very common in Parkinson's. We see changes in depression, 
So that would be defined as sad mood, loss of pleasure and interest, anxiety, worry, fear, agitation, obviously aspects of the disease that could be escalated at this point in time. Psychosis, which is a less talked about feature uh, that some people will experience, but very important to realize what this is. These are hallucinations. So seeing or hearing or feeling things that other people can't see, hear, or feel, they can't experience. And delusions. These are strong, strongly held beliefs that something is going on that other people can't buy into. And we're going to talk quite a bit about the hallucinations and delusions today, because while, while the general population is fairly comfortable and familiar with these ideas of depression and anxiety, the hallucinations and delusions are less common in the general population and I think scarier for individuals who are managing Parkinson's. There are impulse control issues. So these are repetitive behaviors that can be problematic. Um, we'll talk quite a bit about how they look and it's important to realize that the impulse control problems are often associated with the medication regimen that a person might be taking. And then apathy, which is a loss of motivation to act and very often confused and interrelated with depression, but different. So depression and anxiety, the mood changes. These are, these are very frequently combined and interrelated. Oftentimes, if I'm going to diagnose someone who having depression, it's often depression with anxiety or anxiety with depression. Uh, it's tough to pull them apart. They're very, very common changes. Uh, they'll occur in 40% as, as high, there's estimates as high as 60% of individuals who have Parkinson's, often years before the motor signs actually appear. Uh, as I said before, the symptoms will overlap in, in the majority of cases. Uh, and we consider the emergence of depression and anxiety, especially in an individual who's had no, no previous history of, of either, as risk factors for developing Parkinson's disease. Uh, the research will tell us, and I think many of you will experience, that anxiety tends to, to impact a person's quality of life to a greater extent than depression. Um, that sense of being keyed up all the time uh, can be very, very challenging for an individual to manage. Now, the hallucination aspect, this is something that, as I said before, I want to spend some time on. Um, in my talks recently, I've had a lot of questions about, about hallucinations. So hallucinations um, will occur in about 60% of individuals uh, at some point in, um, in their disease course. Tends to be as, as they've uh, managed Parkinson's for longer. Um, it commonly starts as a sense of something in the periphery, a shadow or, or a, an insect flying by, um, or it could be seeing an animal or, or um, something passing through. Very often people will talk to me about misinterpreting a, a physically present object. Uh, for example, maybe walking into a room, seeing a coat rack and perceiving it as a person, um, or driving by a fire hydrant and seeing it as a child. Um, they, they are sometimes described as, as uh, faces or objects that are usually in formless, formless um, abstract backgrounds, like the bark of a tree or clouds. And some individuals will actually experience the presence of someone, like a mist or a shadow, but may not be completely recognizable. They'll just have a feeling that someone is there or that someone has just left the room. And this can be very frightening for an individual who, who isn't aware that this is Parkinson's and, and there are treatments available. I think that's why it's so important to talk about this because for many people who, who are managing Parkinson's, these experiences are out of anything that they were, were uh, told 
about. And it's so important to be informed so that you feel comfortable to talk to your physicians or your, or your healthcare provider about the experiences. Now, delusions, delusions are very, very challenging and they'll occur in about 16%. Their estimates as high as 25% and as low as 10. Uh, these are experiences where um, an individual begins to believe something is occurring and it's a strongly held belief. It's as real to that individual as the fact that the sun is bright in my eyes right now to me. Um, this is a very real thing. And for that reason, it's it's impossible, truthfully, to rationalize that belief out. The delusions can occur in all forms. Jealousy um, could be that uh, the individual believes that their spouse is having an affair. It could be that the individual believes that people are stealing from them or that they have somehow sinned and have done something so wrong that they're being punished. Uh, it could be persecution that, that people are after them. And they can be very, very frightening. Um, a, a less common but well-known uh, condition is believing that your loved one has been replaced by an imposter. And I've had patients tell me, you know, this lovely woman takes such good care of me. And I really am very thankful for that. But I wish my wife would come back. And standing beside him is his wife. And that can be terribly difficult for for the individual who, who is the imposter because they love, they love their spouse so much and, and it's hard to understand why there's no recognition. I've also had folks who, especially coming home from maybe a hospital stay or a long trip, will tell their loved ones that they don't understand who built this house that looks just like theirs but isn't theirs. And so it can be really confusing for the loved one and for the individual who's managing Parkinson's to understand what's going on. And not everyone's going to experience this, but for those of you who do, it's important to realize that, that your healthcare professionals understand and have heard of this before. You're not alone. We know that the frequency and severity of hallucinations and delusions increases as an individual develops worsening cognitive skills. So as a person loses their ability to uh, problem solve or to have strong insight into their experiences, those symptoms get worse. So the majority of people will have some maybe fleeting off and on, not very serious experiences where they've misperceived an object or they have a sense that something has passed them in their periphery. Those individuals tend to have excellent insight into it. I've had, I had a patient who was working with me who said, you know, I know it's not really there, but I swear it looks like you have a kitten in your purse. And we both, we both laughed about it. And I held up my purse and, and he said, yep, it's not there. And we both, we both went on with our day and kept going. Uh, folks, as they get more advanced in their Parkinson's, may begin to experience the presence of someone, especially at night, uh, waking up in the middle of, of a dream and having a sense that someone else is in the room. As the disease continues to progress, some individuals will begin to, to experience well-formed hallucinations, That's, that they can see someone standing there, uh, that that person is doing things in the house. And then at the most severe stage, we start to see delusions or hallucinations that are taking on a reality of their own. And that's the stage that can be most difficult, both for the individual managing Parkinson's and for their care partners and their loved ones. We're gonna talk a lot more about what to do about that in just a second, so hold that thought. Um, impulse control problems are extremely disruptive for everyone in the family. They're oftentimes related to the types of medications that are being used to treat Parkinson's. So under the, I'm going to say the, the last bullet point first, be sure if this is happening to you or your loved one, that you describe this to your healthcare provider. These are compulsive behaviors. They're unwanted, they're disruptive, they could be dangerous, they can be embarrassing. Um, viewing pornography, for example, um, on the internet 
or gambling, which can become financially devastating for a family. Shopping can be, can be troublesome. You know, the constant, well, all of us, all of us are doing this right now, but the constant delivery of Amazon um, to the front door and sometimes to the extent where there's no more room in the, in the closet for these things um, can be very, very challenging. Um, I have in, in parentheses because it's not a bad thing, but scrapbooking. After um, one of the Davis Finney uh, talks that I did, maybe in Tucson or maybe right before that, a woman approached me and said, you know, I scrapbook compulsively. She was waking up in the middle of the night. She was having a hard time sleeping because she was constantly doing these things. So this is important. Talk to your movement disorder team about these symptoms. Uh, we have to look at what your medication regimen is. And then apathy, Ugh, apathy. So all of us have probably experienced periods of apathy during this, however long we've been doing this, six weeks, right? Um, this is just a reduced drive, like kind of the inability to get up and go. And even though you know you should be doing it, can't really make yourself do it. Um, and typically at some point, our brains will say, okay, you know what, Joanne, you haven't exercised in three days. I'm not days. sure I understand. <laughs> Siri, I wasn't talking to you. Um, you know, usually you'd get up and, and go and apathy kind of takes that drive away. And it's hard because it's very often um, mistaken for depression, always too sad to get up and go. But that's not really the case. It's more that the brain is just not telling an individual that it's time. Um, the enjoyment is there once you get going. So it's not sadness. It's just no get up and go. All right, now the cognitive challenges, and remember these are interrelated, um, are very challenging for most individuals with Parkinson's. I want to define some words that doctors use that are, that are difficult sometimes and interrelated. So when Parkinson's first starts, most people will experience very mild cognitive issues, and they might only be noticeable to the individual experiencing them. Um, in fact, caregivers might say, I don't even see that. As cognitive changes progress and they get worse, we start to define it as mild cognitive impairment. And that means that on a neuropsych eval, if we tested your, your skills objectively, we would see that there are some problems, some decline from where your baseline was but it's not so severe that it's causing issues in your day-to-day -day functioning. As those progress, and they don't progress for everyone, but some number of individuals um, early in their disease will experience what we call dementia, which is, is a scary, scary term, but what it means is that a person has developed problems in their thinking that are severe enough that now they are impacting day-to-day -day functioning. Um, and there are, the, the trick I think is that people confuse dementia with Alzheimer's disease, and they're two different things. Dementia just means that a person has severe enough cognitive issues that it affects their day-to-day -day activities, and there are many types of dementia, and Parkinson's disease causes one of those types. Alzheimer's disease causes another, but they're separate. They're not the same thing. We know that cognitive problems in Parkinson's are very, very common. About 15% will describe those problems to me even before they're diagnosed with the disease. Um, about 40%, maybe 50%, will develop mild cognitive problems early in their disease course. And by early, I mean within the first couple of years of, of their motor symptoms being obvious. And then about 10% will develop major cognitive issues, dementia, within three years of their diagnosis. The likelihood of developing these more serious cognitive problems gets higher the longer you've lived with Parkinson's. And most people will develop major cognitive problems as they advance in their journey with Parkinson's, as they you know, hit that 10-year mark, that 15-year mark, that 20-year mark, um, they, they will develop more severe cognitive issues. We know that with the cognitive problems in Parkinson's, that there are some that are maybe more malignant, if you will. They're harbingers of worse decline. Um, when we look at the brain, 
And this is the, the way we do this is the what you see here is the front part. These would normally be your eyes, except for I took your brain right out of there and you can't see your eyes anymore. Um, and this is the back part of your brain. The, the, the cognitive skills that are in the front part of your brain include your executive functions. So that's planning and problem solving, flexibility, organization, um, your ability to, to learn new information, organize it well enough that you can keep track of it. Your speech fluency, um, those people who talked a lot about you know, word finding problems, that's kind of the front part of your brain and emotional control. And then the back part of your brain is really important for your spatial awareness, um, your visual and spatial processing, um, your memory. I, you know, I heard this already, I'm gonna store it and I'm gonna remember it for later and your comprehension of speech. And then of course we have attention that modulates everything and wraps around itself. The anterior cognitive problems, those executive functions are usually the ones that occur earliest in Parkinson's disease. They tend to be most associated with the dopaminergic changes of the frontal lobes, like your motor signs, um, and they may never get progressively worse. They may just kind of be at that level and you learn how to um, cope with them and you put in other um, strategies and they just stay there and they don't get worse and they're not necessarily associated with developing those advanced cognitive problems called dementia. The ones in the back of your brain uh, tend to be more associated with driving problems, with risk of falls. Uh, we see a higher percentage of individuals who have these, these rear posterior cognitive issues developing hallucinations. These are the kind of problems that tend to cause issues with your ability to function daily, daily and independently, and they do predict a more significant cognitive decline. They tend to be related more to the acetylcholine in your brain, um, the type of transmitter that helps you stay alert and focused versus the dopaminergic information in your brain. Now, why do they happen? Why is this happening? They happen for the same exact reasons that you have the motor changes. Parkinson's disrupts the neurochemicals in your brain that transmit information between brain regions, and it changes the function of the neurons themselves that are important for modulating your emotions and your thinking in just the same way that it changes the neurotransmitters and the neurons that modulate your movement. And I think the, the, the takeaway message, if anything, for a care provider is when an individual with Parkinson's is having a rough time with their tremor, we don't tell them to knock it off because we recognize that that's Parkinson's. The same holds for thinking and behavioral changes. Now, granted, personality is personality and some people are maybe just being a jerk at the time, but very often it's a problem with the Parkinson's itself. And that's why it's so important for us to understand these things. Parkinson's disease causes behavioral problems and dysfunction in their motor systems. The serotonin, the dopamine, the frontal lobe atrophy, we start to lose our basal ganglia structures. Um, and that's all associated with your motor signs. Um, there's hypometabolism, less, less uptake of these neurochemicals in the back of your brain compared to the front. And that causes issues. It causes, we see cognitive decline associated with certain types of genetic factors in Parkinson's disease. And of course, age just makes people more vulnerable to that cognitive decline. We see a reduction in those important chemicals that are associated with your thinking, dopamine, acetylcholine, serotonin, um, all are impacted by Parkinson's disease. And of course, the medicine that many people take for Parkinson's disease affects cognition and behavior. So sometimes it improves things like working memory and planning and sequencing, but it can also cause a, a problem with parts of your thinking. Your attention and learning can be affected by some of the medications you take. Some of the medications you take might overstimulate the part of your brain that is associated with reward. And that's why we see those impulse control problems in Parkinson's on certain types of medication. Because let's say gambling, for example, it feels better when you're taking those medications than it would normally feel. 
And your brain then wants to do things that feel good. And it does it to the point where it becomes compulsive. Medications can also overstimulate parts of the brain that are associated with hallucinations. So this is why it's so important to understand that these are symptoms of Parkinson's and to talk to your movement disorder team. Because it could be that you're having these hallucinations because of the medication you're taking. And we can't know that and we can't test that theory if we don't know that you're experiencing these issues. Now, how do these affect our day-to-day -day life? Um, obviously, that's kind of the big point here. And all of you who might be watching right now can probably be yelling at the screen how it's affecting your day-to-day -day life. So let's, let's walk it through. These problems can impact your ability to solve problems and change strategies. You might notice that um, while trying to change out some plumbing, for example, you hit a wall and rather than try a new strategy, you just keep banging your head against a wall. At that point, you need to start to take a break and ask for advice, ask for help. Have, have someone external give you some solutions to the problem. Many people will describe issues with planning and sequencing. Let's say you're gonna to try to take a trip when all this is over. How do you get started? Well, start early. Realize that you may not be as efficient at that anymore as you used to be. Make a list so you can visually see the steps that you're about to take and always finish one step to completion before you jump to the next. It becomes more difficult with Parkinson's to come back to a project and you may end up with 18 different things going on, none of them uh, finished to completion. And that, of course, will contribute to disorganization and you'll start to notice clutter around the house, which is dangerous for a number of reasons. Number one, chaos is difficult to manage for all of us. And number two, the more clutter, the more likely the falls. So think about how you're gonna reduce that disorganization. And I recommend if it's, if it's particularly difficult, hire someone to help you. Hire someone to help develop a system that will make that a little easier for yourself. Losing your train of thought, um, welcome to my life. Um, get halfway through a sentence and then can't remember what you were saying or why you were saying it. Try to avoid that multitasking. Multitasking is actually a made up concept. None of us do that particularly well. Keep it simple. Try to limit interruptions. So if you're working on a project, put up a sign on your office door that says, please don't interrupt. And care providers, please don't interrupt. Um, if, you, if you can do that at all, at all possibilities. Think about uh, fluctuations in your alertness. There are times in the day that things will be easier than others. Identify those times. Realize how important, Connie mentioned this just a second ago, how important rest is. So take a, take a brief nap in the afternoon. And if you're having these changes in alertness, discuss them with your physician so that you can review your medication plans and decide whether there are any issues that could be causing some, some problems with that. Um, frustration with your care partner or vice versa, frustration with your loved one who's managing Parkinson's disease. This, this occurs because it's sometimes hard to remember what a person said. Um, and because of that, there becomes a little bit of a dynamic of you said that, I didn't say that, you did say that. Um, so just realize that communication pattern may need to be simplified a little bit. I say state, rephrase it, repeat it, and then write it down. The more you sit with information, the more likely it is that it will sink in. And that's true for all of us. That forgetfulness um, can become really a problem for individuals, especially those who are used to working at a very high level. And so I always tell people, listen, rely on the technology that lets us be together this morning. Um, use those phones to, to make to-do lists, to set up calendars, have your smartphone remind you of things. I've learned that when I'm watering my garden, if I don't set an alarm, there's a very good chance I will water everyone's garden um, for days at a time, it turns out. And that can get really expensive in California. Um, so set the reminders, let it alarm you and tell you, hey, don't forget you were gonna do X in 15 minutes. Don't rely on your memory to do that. Be cautious about falls. Because of those changes that occur in the back part of your brain, some individuals will have more trouble navigating their physical world. You'll notice bumping into furniture, 
tripping on the stairs, um, difficulty just navigating distances. Uh, and because of that, I always say, listen, it might not be aesthetically pleasing, but go ahead and mark those stairs so that it gives your brain an extra trigger to notice, hey, I need to, I need to step up or step down here. Um, use assistive devices. If your physical therapist tells you that you would be wise to use a cane for stability, use the cane for stability, at least until you've practiced balance yoga long enough that you don't need it anymore. And think about rehab balance, rehabbing your balance, yoga, uh, gait training. That's one area of Parkinson's that is actually pretty consistently retrainable but you have to activate that part of the brain that talks to your body and tells it where your body is so that you can do the, you can balance better. Realize that worsening cognitive problems will impact your independence. So delegate those stupid tasks that all of us have to do so that you can focus on meaningful experiences. If monthly bill paying has become such a problem that you're missing things or that bills are going unpaid or that you're stressing about it over time, find a trusted individual who can help out with that. So you can spend more time loving your family and sleeping and exercising. Realize that depression and anxiety is going to impact your quality of life more than your motor signs. Um, engage your community, reach out to support groups, think about talking to family members about your experiences, use behavioral techniques um, to manage your depression and anxiety. And if those behavioral techniques aren't enough, then talk to your physician about this and consider adding a, a geriatric psychiatrist to your team who can help you manage medications uh, that won't impact the medications you're already on. Do not be embarrassed or scared if you're having hallucinations and misidentification, uh, misidentifications. Don't be so, so embarrassed and scared that you won't tell anyone about this. We understand now in the Parkinson's world that this is much more common than anyone ever realized. Um, behaviorally, you can start to reduce shadows, try to reduce mem uh, mirrors. It's hard for the, the brain to understand what it's seeing in real time. And sometimes that contributes to the hallucinations. I tell my patients, if you're seeing something like the, the kitten in my purse, stare at it for a few seconds. And very often that lets the brain catch up in time and, and perceive what was really there. Um, and again, talk to your doctors early about these, these issues, because if it is a medication problem, that medication can be switched and a lot of angst removed. For the impulse control problems, um, tell, tell someone that this is going on. Care providers, as well as individuals managing Parkinson's, speak up and talk to your physicians about these so they can search through your medication list and make sure that there isn't some medication interaction that's causing these problems. And for apathy, realize apathy is, much of, is as much a part of Parkinson's as the tremor. And sometimes you just need some behavioral or some outside help to get started. So think about um, scheduling appointments with a loved one or, or gym memberships. Think about hiring a trainer, use alarms and initiate that activity with someone else so that once you get started, it becomes a routine and it's really enjoyable once you get going. It's just hard, it's hard to get going. And all of us are experiencing it right now. And realizing you're gonna hear this from every one of your speakers because that's why we love Davis Finney Foundation, but exercise is medicine. For Parkinson's disease, we know that it improves the ability to move, it improves the ability to think, and your mood is also improved. And this it goes across the board. This isn't just for, park, for folks who are managing Parkinson's. This is for all of us. There are studies that show that exercise is just as effective at improving a person's mood as an antidepressant. So get started. Um, think about all the different ways you can do this. And we're gonna hear about this a lot today, so I won't belabor it at this point in time. But once we can get out of this, boxing is pretty fun, just not in the head. Um, yoga and Tai Chi are also fantastic. All right, so 
I want to spend just a little bit of time thinking about ways we can manage the situation we're in right now. Um, first and foremost, when you're talking about having some cognitive issues, think about visiting someone who is a neuropsychologist like I am. Um, it's helpful to know where the strengths and weaknesses are so that you can really develop a personalized approach to managing them. But for everybody, limit distractions. Try not to be doing your finances with the TV on, with music on, with people running in and out because it's hard to stay on track. Uh, maintain a consistent schedule. That's extremely important right now. Get up at the same time, focus on your to-do list early in the morning when you're feeling fresh, simplify tasks um, into, into single steps if you can, remind everyone else to slow down. That's, that's a universal trait of Parkinson's. Um, the body slows a bit, the mind slows a bit, uh, and, and those around us should slow a little bit. Have them repeat themselves. Make sure that they're not speaking too quickly. Identify the best times of the day to approach a problem. Uh, I'm gonna guess that once you're tired, your skills decline, mine do. And so think about when you're feeling most alert. And this, I, I'm so sorry that I even put this, but reduce stress, which is a joke right now, um, but there are ways to do it. Let's talk a little bit about that now. So for all of this, for everyone involved in um, this talk, that's care providers, panelists, myself, and people who are managing Parkinson's, we are in, and this word is overused now, an unprecedented time. There has never been a time where um, the entire globe has been experiencing such incredible problems. So it's important that we label our feelings. I get really unsettled when I go to a grocery store. Um, and so when I get home, sometimes I'm impatient with my family. And, and you have to realize, why am I feeling weird? Um, just label it, start, start there. And once you label it, then you, you have an entity that you can attack. Until it's unlabeled and it's just sort of this big feeling, it's very hard to know what to do with it. Connie mentioned this, turn off the news. Give yourself maybe half an hour in the morning and a half an hour in the afternoon to listen to it in case there's anything new. But this constant stream of talking heads increases anxiety and we get conflicted information from different sources. So just turn it off. Listen to it at a very prescribed period of time during the day. And, and then the rest of the time, turn on some music, do something that's nicer. It's hard right now. Um, today, by the way, is Saturday. But if you all are experiencing trouble figuring out what day it is, join our club. Um, we are not used to living in an amorphous world. So get on a schedule. Force yourself to wake up at the same time every day. Exercise at the same time every day. Set a period of time where you're gonna knock off a project every day and then go to sleep on time. People are telling me that because of this, they're, they're going to bed at one o'clock in the morning where they used to go to bed at 10 because they're busy on Facebook or they're busy watching the news. Get your routine back in, in place. Connect with your loved ones. You're gonna to have to be creative. Um, send a daily card. How wonderful is it to go to the, the mailbox and have something there besides a bill or garbage? Um, think about planning a trip reassure and reconnect daily and that is especially for those of you who have your um, loved one who might be in an assisted living facility on lockdown right now call every day um, if you can and think about what it is you want to talk about just these daily phone calls how are you i'm good you know it doesn't get us anywhere plan a trip together um, send a photo album and talk about better fun times <laughs> Find alone time. If you're at home with small children or with your loved ones, you know that that privacy time that you used to have is gone. So you have to be creative. Take a really long shower if you don't live in a drought state. Um, garden, vacuum, um, walk around, paint, put on headphones so that you can just cancel out some noise for a while. And then practice mindfulness. I've put some here, some apps that are fantastic. This just gives you a chance, five minutes a day, to focus on yourself and to bring yourself back to the present. Um, I recommend a five minute stint in the morning and at lunch and before you go to bed. 
we talked about it. Exercise is medicine. I'm going to put in a shameful plug for, there's a, an app called Nike Fit Club. And I know that we're not supposed to do that, but they're, they're, it's a fantastic, easy to use app. Gives you a little, um, gives you little uh, fitness programs that you can do right off your phone. Walk, go to Davis Finney Foundation. There are fantastic exercise um, uh, programs there. Remember to be physically distanced, but not emotionally distanced. So don't wait for others to reach out to you. Reach out to them. And you might even have to do it the old-fashioned way, by the telephone. Um, this is important. Telemedicine is available right now. This is probably the bright spot of all of this. Um, do not stop going to your doctor because you're afraid to go outside. We're In our clinic, we're, we're realizing that people aren't coming to the doctor um, as regularly as they need to. Um, and this is going to cause more problems down the line. So it's, it's time to reach out to your doctor and keep up with your regularly scheduled appointments. And if that has to be through telemedicine, that's okay. The great thing about telemedicine is that you can now reach out to mental health providers in a much easier way than you used to be able to. Um, psychologytoday.com is a fantastic website where you can put in your location, the type of doctor you want to see, um, the issues that you might be having, and your insurance. And it'll pop up a whole bunch of people who practice that type of psychology. Um, reach out to others, help others. Realize that all of us are in this together. And sometimes if you change your focus away from yourself and onto someone else who needs, who needs you, who is um, maybe even more challenged than you are, your mood will improve dramatically. Use behavioral techniques to improve your mood. List three have tos and three want tos. And for every have to, give yourself a reward and chart your mood. Notice how much better you're feeling just because you're starting to get things done. And then finally, find humor. Um, watch those old comedies and laugh and be silly and reach out to, to your grandchildren. Um, Zoom a a birthday um, celebration with them or Zoom a bedtime story every night. Set it up as part of your routine to give yourself um, that, that love and that enjoyment that we used to have daily. All right, and finally, and I think that's that for me, um, some action steps. And we, I tried to give you a whole bunch of these this time, but overall, um, recognize that non-motor signs are common and prevalent in Parkinson's and speak to your movement disorder specialist about them. I can't tell you how many people don't bring them up. Um, maybe they are afraid. These are things we know exist now and we're available to help you understand them better. Incorporate that structure into your life. We talked about it throughout the talk. Get up at the same time. Schedule your exercise, schedule your project, schedule your bedtime, and consider behavioral activation uh, techniques. Three must-dos, three want-tos, and reward yourself to overcome that loss of structure. Recognize how important stress reduction practices are. So that's mindfulness, yoga, tai chi, and exercise and regularly review your medication list with your pharmacist to, and your physician to identify possibly dis, uh, dangerous interactions because many people with Parkinson's are, are uh, polypharmacy, a bunch of different drugs. And sometimes one type of doctor doesn't realize that the medications she's prescribing are actually um, interfering with the medications another doctor is prescribing. So um, pharmacists can be very helpful in identifying those interactions and obviously your physician should be aware of everything you're taking.